So good morning, I'm Paul Tugwood. I'm from uh, the University of California, San Francisco, and I've uh, been asked to talk about a extremely common topic, which is displaced geriatric femoral neck fractures. Um, so to be clear, I'm not talking about femoral neck fractures in the young, and I'm not talking about femoral neck fractures that are vagus impacted or non-displaced. I'm talking about elderly patients with displaced injuries. Don't have any disclosures. So usually when I give a talk uh, to a group in a trauma symposium, I like to show a really exciting case, you know, like a mangled limb or a pelvis that's all out of whack. And unfortunately with this topic, that's not really applicable. Um, this is the exciting case. And obviously all of us have dealt with this hundreds of times. Uh, so this is not a real patient. This is one made up, but obviously familiar to everyone. So it's an 87 year old gentleman. He fell at home, probably got his toe, you know, caught on the carpet. He's got a bunch of medical problems. Uh, he may have not be as sharp as he used to be. Maybe he even has frank diagnosed dementia. And he walks short distances. He putters, putters around the house. Um, so this, this all seems a little dull. Uh, probably no one's pulse rate has gone up with the description of this case. Uh, but it's important, okay? And it's important for the following reasons. So first of all, these are extremely common. Probably none of us can get through a week without having to deal with a displaced geriatric femoral neck fracture. Okay, it's a real public health epidemic uh, in this country. And treatment is at the very least urgent. Probably all of us would agree that uh, delaying treatment more than 24 hours is probably not ideal. And a lot of hospital systems are trying to get to the point where we can do it within 24 hours even faster. And there's a study going on right now that's trying to determine if maybe it's not only urgent, but it's emergent. So there's a hip attack study uh, going on, trying to look at outcomes before and after six hours. Um, so it's something that needs to be dealt with quickly at the very least. Another reason it's important to your patients is there is often a decline in function. I usually tell my patients pessimistically that there's about a 50% chance they're gonna return to their baseline activity and a 50% chance uh, that they're gonna have a significant obvious loss uh, function. And there is a relatively high rate of complications. Uh, so although these are procedures we do commonly uh, and we usually feel pretty skilled at doing them, uh, I try to stress to my residents that it's still not something that should be done casually. I'll show the complication rates here in the literature, but they're not, they're not minor. Um, so for all these reasons, although it's a common uh, topic, uh, it's an important one. So the objectives today, I'm going to very briefly compare ORIF of these injuries to arthroplasty and uh, just hopefully remind everyone why we do what we do and why we treat these with arthroplasty. I'm then going to compare total hip to hemiarthroplasty, which has been a relatively hot topic in the last uh, decade or so. And then I'm going to go over three technical considerations uh, of arthroplasty as listed there, uh, approach, fixation, and uh, implant choice. So first to talk about ORIF uh, versus arthroplasty. Uh, so probably very few of us are putting internal fixation in for geriatric displaced femoral neck fractures. I do it very commonly for young. And the, what is young is a bit of a moving target uh, in 2018 as the population ages and, and people get more active uh, in their older years. However, just to remind everyone, there is very good evidence that in geriatric patients with displaced femoral neck fractures, open reduction and in internal fixation is inferior to arthroplasty, really without question. There's probably at least 10 good randomized control trials that prove this definitively. And the reasons are there's a high rate of failure of fixation, uh, and this leads to early reoperation. And even if these patients do go on to heal, there is no time point where their pain and function is superior than with an arthroplasty, okay? And uh, again, there's a lot of studies that demonstrate this. This is just one. Uh, so this was one that was published relatively recently. A good sized study with almost 150 patients. Average age was 84, displaced femoral neck fractures. Uh, half of them uh, were treated with ORIF, about half were treated with the total hip. And you can see the failure rates were not even remotely similar. So the rate of uh, failure of fixation and necessity for reoperation was over 50% in the group where ORF was attempted, as opposed to total hip arthroplasty, the rate was a tenth of that. So um, all of us uh, can safely discuss uh, with these patients that arthroplasty is really the standard of care uh, 
uh, ORAF should only be done really in exceptionally rare circumstances. So moving on to comparing hemiarthroplasty to total hip arthroplasty, the first thing I'll say is that in my review of the literature looking at a, a large group of studies, the major complication rates in these two procedures are essentially comparable. And what do I mean by major complications? It's the things that we all hate getting phone calls about, dislocation, infection, periprosthetic fracture. The rates of these three things are quite similar whether you do a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip arthroplasty. Okay, they're somewhere in the five to 10% range. Importantly, when I'm making this statement, I'm excluding single dislocations in total hips. So if you, inc if you include one-time dislocators, uh, at least on my reading of the literature, there's a clear disadvantage to total hip arthroplasty. Uh, as compared to hemiarthroplasty. However, uh, if you exclude those and say a single dislocation that's successfully closed reduced is not a major complication, the rates of these major complications are essentially the same. However, there are unique complications um, uh, to, to both of these. Uh, one specifically for hemiarthroplasty is acetabular erosion. Uh, so there's good evidence that um, if these uh, patients live more than a few years, the majority of them will show acetabular erosion, usually not necessarily as significant as the one I'm showing here. Um, but about 20% will need to go on to conversion to a total hip arthroplasty for acetabular erosion and pain dysfunction. Uh, uh, which leads to my next comment, which is that it also seems pretty clear that in patients that are more active than the case example I gave, these people have reduced function and lower quality of life scores than people who get a total hip arthroplasty. Um, so there is more pain and more dysfunction in the hemiarthroplasty group uh, if they are relatively high functioning at baseline, uh, which just means that they are independent ambulators outside of the house. This is just a study that basically demonstrates the things that I just said. Uh, so this was published about a decade ago, a relatively small cohort, but it compared hemiarthroplasty uh, to total hip arthroplasty. And if you look at the results on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see clearly, I think, functionally, the patients in the total hip group were doing better. Uh, these patients were walking about twice as far. Their hip scores were improved. Uh, and if you look at the uh, complications listed there on the right, uh, again, there's a higher rate of acetabular erosion, not surprisingly, in a hemiarthroplasty group. Uh, the total hips did have a higher dislocation rate, um, although most of these were, symbol, were single events that were treated closed uh, with a reduction, and the overall reoperation rates were comparable. So the, the take-home message for hemiarthroplasty versus total hip arthroplasty, I think, is that both of these are important techniques. They should be used in different populations. For the vast majority of patients that were similar to the ones that I described in my case example, people who are um, basically restricted to the household, not performing most of their uh, IADLs, hemiarthroplasty really remains an excellent operation for these patients. For patients who are younger, more highly active, total hip is a good option uh, due to improved uh, functional scores uh, compared to hemiarthroplasty. So in my remaining time, I'm just going to touch on a couple of technical um, variables uh, for arthroplasty. And the first one is approach. There's already been some talks on approach uh, this morning. And I always hate talking about approaches because it's a very emotional topic for surgeons, it seems. Uh, everyone likes their approach and can argue for half an hour about it, as was already done this morning. Uh, however, uh, for hemiarthroplasty, this, these are the numbers that uh, I usually uh, discuss with my residents. So, um, there seems to me a clear reduction in dislocation events when you use a direct lateral or hard edge approach compared to a posterior approach. Uh, there's multiple studies that in my mind uh, make this relatively clear. Generally when I round on these patients the next morning about half of them are curled up into a ball with their hips flexed to 120 degrees. Uh, and so that is the reason that in my hands I use a direct lateral approach. Um, certainly you can still dislocate uh, after a hard edge, but most of these patients uh, seem to go out the back. An anterior approach is something that perhaps could avoid uh, these problems. Um, there was a differing opinions this morning on what, how that affects dislocation rates. Uh, there is a well-documented risk of greater trochanter fracture when performing uh, an anterior approach for hemiarthroplasty, and it probably has to do with a couple of things. Uh, number one, these patients' bone quality is obviously generally going to be poorer than most people who are getting a total hip arthroplasty for arthritis. Uh, and number two, this may not 
this may be uh, being done by surgeons who are trying to teach themselves to the anterior approach on the way to performing total hip arthroplasty. Um, probably not uh, the best way to do that uh, as the bone quality is um, uh, poor and a lot of retraction is necessary on the femur to get it elevated to perform um, uh, broaching. Uh, so um, I personally uh, stay away from anterior approaches uh, for, for hemiarthroplasty. Uh, this is a study that just uh, provides a little bit of meat uh, to what I said regarding the lateral and the posterior approach. So this is a big study over 700 patients uh, relatively recently, and they had a clear uh, reduction in dislocation rates with a hardage approach as opposed to posterior approaches with or without capsular repair. So again, I'm not here to convince you uh, to change your approach. I'm just here to give you some data. Uh, I perform all my total hips through a posterior approach. I perform all my hemiarthroplasties through a hardage. All right, next moving on to fixation. Um, obviously there are two options. You can either press fit a stem and you can cement it. And I think the key here is not to be dogmatic. I run into surgeons who always press fit. I run into surgeons who always cement. I don't think either of those approaches is great. I do both. Um, and I usually let the bone quality uh, tell me what to do. Um, but just to review what the advantages and disadvantages are, so obviously a press fit stem is faster. It's faster in terms of uh, not having to wait for cement to dry, clearly. That can seem like a long time for some surgeons, myself included. Uh, there is uh, not a risk of intra, uh, cardiac, intra cardiac collapse the way there is with cementing. Um, it's a very rare event, but it's a very difficult one to explain to the family if it happens. There's probably a number of people in this audience who have had that uh, happen over the course of their career. Uh, that is offset by the fact that it's very clear there's a higher rate of fracture uh, with press fit stems. This, uh, of course, makes sense. You're trying to get a snug geometric fit uh, into the proximal femur. That increases your risk for fracture. And I would also say in my reading of the literature, there is a little bit of an advantage of cemented stems in terms of immediate postoperative functioning of patients. Um, uh, I didn't put any numbers up there, but my general sense, having looked at a lot of studies to put this talk together, uh, is that uh, there is a slight advantage to immediate functioning uh, with cemented stems that don't have a period of ingrowth that is required. Um, again, I don't think either one or the other uh, is mandatory. I do both. I let the bone quality at the time of surgery tell me uh, what to do. However, if you are going to cement a stem, make sure you're telling your anesthesiologist you're going to do it, and these people should be getting some volume prior to doing that. And if you're going to press fit a stem, make sure you're looking for fracture and prepared to manage that with cables if it happens. Uh, the last variable I'm going to talk to you about is uh, if you choose a hemiarthroplasty, what sort of implant to choose. There are bipolar and there are unipolar arthroplasties. The reason bipolar arthroplasties were introduced was to try to get rid of this risk of acetabular erosion that you see with unipolar hemiarthroplasties. Uh, in brief, uh, that did not pan out. If you are trying to avoid acetabular erosion, I would recommend using, doing a total hip and not doing a bipolar arthroplasty. There's many, many studies, including the one, uh, oops, that uh, I will show here, uh, that demonstrates there's essentially no difference between bipolar and unipolar uh, hemiarthroplasties. You can use whatever you want. I think you're gonna get the same result. So in summary, um, for geriatric displaced femoral neck fractures, arthroplasty is clearly superior to ORAF. I would say there's no debate on that, and that's probably why all of you are performing arthroplasties on your patients. Uh, total hip and hemiarthroplasty are both uh, excellent options. I think the major complication rates excluding single dislocation events are about the same. And I think you should be making that uh, decision based off of the functionality of the patient. If you have a high functioning patient, I would recommend a total hip. If you have a low functioning patient, I think a hemiarthroplasty uh, and the stability that affords is beneficial. Uh, for me personally, approach wise, I use a hardage approach for hemiarthroplasties. I do both press fit and uh, cemented stems. I let the bone tell me what to do and I just recognize the pros and cons of those two fixation strategies. And I think unipolar and bipolar arthroplasty are equivalent. I would not use a bipolar arthroplasty to try to get out of doing a total hip arthroplasty if you think someone needs to avoid acetabular erosion. Thank you very much for your time.